Hi, this is Chris Hall. Sorry I've got a cold right now. Uh, welcome back to my channel. It has been a couple of years since the last video uh, and a fair bit has transpired in those last two years. Uh, namely, I've uh, been suffering from cancer and this has uh, created some uh, unfortunate outcomes health-wise. And for me, one of the reasons it took me so long to do this video was simply the prospect of seeing myself on screen uh, looking thin and with hair missing etc but I hope you can overlook that and uh, join me on this trip through the fabrication of this futon cabinet it's a futon cabinet not for Western futon but for Japanese ones my client uh, uses Japanese futon and uh, they're quite a bit smaller than Western ones this cabinet is designed to hold uh, two sets and associated beddings. This video does not begin at the beginning of construction but rather we're joining in at the stage where I am completing some work on the latticed side panels of the cabinet, the corners of which are fastened with a pair of glued in Bubingus blinds. The material for this cabinet is a combination of Cuban mahogany which is akin to working with uh, unicorn horns uh, these days. And I had some exceptionally wide uh, planks of Honduran mahogany, uh, 48 inches wide, which allowed me to obtain quite wide quarter sawn panels for the back, top, and doors of the cabinet. Yeah, I used to have long hair uh, and then when my son was about seven months old I decided short hair made more sense uh, and now I kind of find myself looking at a guy with no hair which uh, you know it's not not ideal but uh, at this stage it hadn't all fallen out yet uh, you'll see that later These lattice side panels attach to their respective uh, corners, posts, tops and bottoms by way of sliding dovetail keys. I finished a couple of the interior panels by way of hand plane, then 400 grit sanding. And this worked fine, but the thing with sanding is it leaves a slightly grayed surface as compared to the bright sheen you get with hand planing. So I decided for all the faces that showed on the outside of the cabinet, I would hand plane them only, doing my best to avoid any tool marks. If there were tool marks, well, that's a reflection of where I'm at in my work. But I'm uh, striving, and I think really the goal of hand planing is to produce a tool mark free surface. It's not easy, especially in quarter sawn material where you have to guard against tear out. But it can be done. And I think if it can be done by a guy who has neuropathy in his arms and has very little strength, like I, I can't even curl a 15 pound weight with my left hand now, um, I think if I can do it, other people can too. It's not impossible. I'm using the traditional construction method of dovetailed battens on the backs of these panels. The battens uh, in concert with the styles surrounding the panels and rails uh, serve to produce a structure which is quite resistant to racking. 
the uh, battens are in Cuban mahogany and uh, unlike the panels which are Honduran mahogany. It really took all my strength to plane these. Uh, I think actually being weak is, is a good way to s approach hand planing and not try to overpower everything. But I, I wouldn't recommend being this weak. Because this cabinet stores beddings, I didn't really want to use an oil-based finish and a film-based finish would have meant certain parts of the cabinet would have been rather onerous to deal with. So I decided to take a risk, in this culture at least, and do what uh, the Japanese would turn shiraki or uh, white wood work, that is wood that is finished only with a plane. And uh, I rubbed some wax on it for a little protection against dirt. But otherwise, this cabinet is basically au naturel. The door frames of the cabinet are just one inch thick, while the panels themselves are three-eighths of an inch thick. This means in order to have battens that have any decent stiffness to them, you have to have the batten stick uh, out into the interior of the cabinet. So I, in order to transition from the styles to the battens in a clean way, given they stick out further than the, the styles do, I put these scallops on each end of these battens. At this stage of the project, I'd uh, had, uh, unfortunately, some chemotherapy treatments, and this had caused uh, most of my hair to fall out. So I'm uh, now a baseball cap wearing fellow, or, or at least I was at that stage. see the use of a couple of uh, clamping blocks as the outer styles of each door have a 45 degree uh, bevel cut on them and are difficult to clamp otherwise.
one of the things I like about my Wadkin table saw is with uh, 72 inches of rip available, I have a large dead flat surface which is perfect for doing glue ups. Now here it kind of looks like I'm using a chisel to split uh, the tenon open with a kerf, but tenon's already kerfed, but sometimes when a, a joint goes together it gets clamped a bit tight and it's hard to get a wedge in. So uh, driving a chisel in there can help uh, give you a starting point for your wedge. In my previous video I trimmed such things as this with a router and a chisel, but uh, in this case my saws were back from Japan after having been uh, resharpened there. The back of the cabinet is comprised of two Honduran mahogany panels and a surrounding framework composed of three styles and two rails along with eight dovetailed battens. So getting it all together can be a little bit of a, a, little bit of a task, but uh, fortunately things seem to fit pretty well. The long tenons are going to pass right through the middle style and enter a slot on the other side. This is a form of a joint called a rod mortise and tenon or sao tsugi in Japanese. I'm doing these ones with a single wedge and um, well every project's a chance to try some new joinery isn't it? Here I'm fitting the upper rail and you can see the tenon from the middle style pokes right on through and sticks out uh, where it in turn serves as a locating tab for the panel when it is put into the rest of the cabinet. While I've lost weight elsewhere, my fingers remain a little bit fat for tasks like this. It's a very tiny uh, wedging pin. And uh, one new thing I'm doing is using my Nipex uh, plier wrenches as a very controlled means of squeezing things together. And I, I have other uses for these in woodwork too. They're a very handy tool.
Look out soon for an announcement for an international competition of short stroke sawing. These are fiddly little things. The demand of the camera viewing position left me with an awkward work position. These next few scenes are jumping back and forth a bit between looking at the inside of the assembly and the outside of the assembly where I'm trimming the pegs. So hope that explains uh, any uh, potential confusion here. With the middle uh, style put in and all the battens tightened up, it's time to put on the outer styles. Um, as always, gluing presents a certain amount of trepidation and you just have to be calm and methodical. This back panel assembly is uh, held to the rest of the cabinet using a system I've uh, given in these past few years, namely the use of clips. In this case, I'm fitting the clips to the inside of the cabinet, uh, so they won't really be visible. on the inside of this cabinet and these represent the Mark III version of this form of drawer construction which is uh, I derived from Scandinavian NK or ENCO drawer practice. The main difference with uh, this cabinet is the drawer sides and runners uh, were previously made of two-piece construction using a sliding hammerhead joint now are milled out of billet so to speak i.e. the runner and the side are one piece. I think this makes for a stronger drawer, but more importantly it allows the drawer sidewall to be pushed outwards relative to the runner, thus increasing interior drawer volume. Drawer back to sidewall connections wedged, I can then move on to gluing the front panels.
place the frame members together initially dry just so I will be able to uh, fasten the joinery for the battens in a subsequent step. dovetails fastened, I can then proceed to glue the uh, frame corners.
dovetails locked in place I could remove the short side frame members, apply some glue and complete the assembly. In the past I've done these joints dry and they work just fine over time uh, as well but given they're not really demountable it uh, seems like they may as well be glued. These panels are located underneath the uh, two drawer bank that occupies the middle of the cabinet. As such, they're completely hidden from view, but in this case, their purpose is to prevent any beddings in the lower compartment from getting tangled up with the drawer mechanism. One design change that was made during the build was the addition of this piece which is a stiffener that goes across the front of the drawer bank just to uh, keep its ability to resist sagging from items placed in the drawer to a uh, very minimum. I used a technique of pre-compressing the grain prior to the fit in order to get a nice tight junction between the two parts. Mm-hmm. 
Setting the drawer bank framing aside for the moment, I return to uh, finish up on the side lattice panel frame members, which needed a little attention at their miter joints. I begin by placing the assembled top panel, frame and panel assembly, uh, down. Uh, so I will be assembling this cabinet upside down to start. On go the lattice sides with their four sliding dovetail connections. Post connection involves partially engaging the uh, upper tenon and then when it's down just a bit the sliding dovetail keys on the sides can then be engaged and then the whole post driven down. Unlike the rear posts, which can go on one by one, the front posts have to go together as, as an assembly with the uh, stiffening beam that goes under the drawer bank. There's an additional stiffening cross member which goes across the top of the posts and supports the uh, frame and panel top. Like the lower one, it ties to the posts using mortise and tenon joints. Once the front posts are put together with the stiffeners, the assembly can go on much like the rear posts, tilting in the tenons, lowering down, and then engaging the sliding dovetails.
the middle shelf frame members can go on, the drawer support rails have to be placed. These connect to the latticed sides using tongue and groove joints. Now keeping in mind this is upside down, the next piece to go in is the middle shelf with its stiffening batten. I can't help but laugh at my slack-jawed expression during some of these video clips. It's a little tricky to put these together because there's so many points of engagement at the same time. Installation of the drawer bank framing for the back side. Once the drawer bank front framing is pushed all the way into position, I need to engage the stiffener, which as you can see slides down on half dovetails, which will soon be wedged. This is the traditional way to have a clamp festival. The lower frame is kept off of the floor by a four-piece sill arrangement. Here I'm fitting the short side sill members which connect with sliding dovetails. As you can see, this framework first slides on the four post tenons and then it will engage with a pair of floating tenons on each side that uh, will connect it permanently to the latticed side panels.
The word kibana translates as wooden nose, and uh, these small pieces give the corners of the sill joints a lapped appearance. The long side frame members engage simultaneously with two of the post tenons and five sliding dovetails, namely on the other silk connecting pieces and the floor support battens. the back of the cabinet, a uh, drawer bank, and I use Yatoba for the pegs. These pegs uh, tie the latticed side frames, which are tied to the posts, and the post tenons through the sill, uh, or the lower framework. And then this is the final peg to go in and lock the whole shebang together. The back frame panel has some differences from previous ones I've done. Uh, the styles each have a projecting tenon on the top which engages with a corresponding hole in the uh, cabinet's upper frame. Then it's fixed on the sides by four clips each as you'll see uh, soon. From here on out, the cabinet is standing as per normal on its base. Are you holding those? Yeah. 
Oh, I have them. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, well, are you holding them for me? That's very kind. Daddy, could you make this little small piece of wood and this small piece of wood for me? Yes. Daddy said you could, we could bring this small piece of wood home. Great. Right, do you want me to put it in my purse? Yeah. It's a small piece. The arrangement of this uh, demountable frame and panel back and its clips is reversed to what I've done previously, where the clips were applied on the very back wall of the cabinet. Here, all the clips are applied through the you know inside of the cabinet, and uh, because it's so deep, they're not really uh, too apparent. like a chisel can always be sharper. I try to do the drawer fitting in three rounds of adjustment, but sometimes it takes more.
the back panel is notched on its inner face so that it can engage against the back of the drawer bank framing and then this uh, hammer headed drawbar drives in knocking the peg out on the way in um, and by locking the two together I, I uh, give the stiffness of the back panel to the back of the drawer bank so it's another means by which I can prevent it from sagging over time. I designed some custom hinges out of nickel silver uh, for this cabinet. These allow the doors to swing open 270 degrees. Uh, the hinge plates are connected to one another using a small uh, brass pin. I left a little extra material on the inner style so that I could adjust the doors to one another once everything was in place. door sorted it was time for final fitting of the drawers and applying the hardware in this case these are sourced from Japan and they're in what is called a uh, white shibuichi finish the same kind of hardware I used on a previous cabinet just a different uh, finish The last connections to go in are a set of pins top and bottom that connect the latticed side panels which are very stiff to the posts front and back. These pins help prevent the two parts from sliding against one another as they might if the cabinet were racked.
The door pulls I made on my milling machine, again using some nickel silver plate and uh, Torx head fasteners. This is how my maker's mark was applied to this piece.